Thank the Lord. All right, how many of you brought your Bible this morning? Will you hold up the Word of God all over the building? And I want to ask you to join me, if you will, in the uh, book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 32, and that's page number one. Th uh, I'm sorry, 113. If you have an old Schofield Bible, Exodus chapter 32, and if you'll open your Bible there and then just leave it open for just a little bit. I want to kind of use this whole chapter, but I'll I'll do it quickly. And I know you got things to do after church. And and many of you are going over maybe to take your dad for a cookout or maybe fix homemade ice cream or some pound cake or whatever. But uh, I appreciate you coming, sharing this Father's Day Sunday morning with us. So I won't preach a long time. I won't keep you long. Somebody said that's what uh, Elizabeth Taylor told her eighth husband. I won't keep you long. So I ain't going to keep you long. But if you'll just stay with me for a moment, I want to share something with you. Exodus chapter 32. Now, don't forget the service this afternoon. Now, I encourage you, go see your earthly father. I encourage that. If you can't see him, call him. Uh, I'd give anything if I called my daddy or go see him today. I would, but I can't. He's in heaven now. We're separated by a great gulf. But uh, Jesus is coming soon, and, and that's going to be all right, be taken care of. But if you can go see your dad, go see your dad. But don't forget to come back and see your heavenly father tonight, all right? At the 530 for our service, hope you'll be back. Ordinarily, uh, Father's Day and Mother's Day are two of the lower attended Sunday evening services. So let's just break the, let's be the exception to that rule and be in church tonight, all right? Exodus chapter 32, if you're there, would you say amen? All right. Normally on Father's Day, as I do each Mother's Day, I preach a message to all of the fathers that are present in our service. And in that service, I always just try to challenge all of us dads because I, I am one, and I know the battles and the struggles that we go through, but I, I try to encourage us. Let's be the right kind of examples in front of our families. We want our families to serve the Lord. We want our families to love God, love Jesus, and love church. And mu much of that stems from the kind of example that the father lives out in front of the, the children. There's an old saying that I read one time that goes something like this. Look up on the screen. It says, children are not likely to find God as their father until they see something of God in their father. Now, can I stop and say amen to that? Children are not likely to get saved and live for God until they see their daddy saved and loving Jesus and living for God. You know, for years we thought that the way to reach families was through the children. So we bought church buses, and by the way, we still do. And we run church buses, and by the way, we still do that. And we hope that we can win the children. And the children will go home and tell mom and dad about Jesus, and maybe they'll get saved as well. Then we kind of switched from that. We thought, well, no, maybe there's a better way. Let's reach the mama. And if we can reach the wife and we can reach the mother, then that'll be a quick way of reaching the family. And by the way, there are cases uh, where that has worked before. Maybe many of you sitting in the church today, maybe as our ladies, you were the first that got saved, and then you got after your husband and your children. Now the whole family's saved. What a great way to reach the family. But you know, more often than not, by far and away, the best way to reach the family is by reaching the dad, the husband. Buddy, I'm telling you, if you can reach the daddy and the husband of the family, it's almost a given that the entire family is then going to get saved. So I want to say again that children are not likely to find God as their father until they see something of God in their father. Once again, just reminding us all of the responsibility that us dads has upon our shoulders. Hey, let's be the right kind of examples. Let's love Jesus. Let's love the Bible. Let's love God. Let's love church and be the right kind of an example. The, the bad thing about our day is we have too many bad examples. And God help us as men to set the, set the bar and, and to be the right kind of examples uh, in front of our families. But I'm going to break from all that this morning. This is my 25th year at Woodland. So at the end of this year, I'll be closing out 25 years at this church. So for 25 Sunday mornings, I have preached Father's Day messages uh, in our church. Behind this pulpit, I've stood up for 25 years on Father's Day and just fussed and fussed and yelled at us men to do what is right. But this morning, I'm going to deviate from that for just a little bit. My audience this morning is much broader than that because this morning, for all of us that sit in this service, I want to one more time tell you this. We are great sinners. Jesus is a great Savior. And he offers a great salvation. Now, I hope you'll listen in this morning because I want to preach from Exodus chapter 32 on we're great sinners, Jesus is a great Savior, 
and he has a great salvation for anybody who will trust him. I'm preaching this morning on this thought. I'm preaching on the sin of Sinai. The sin of Sinai. I actually, in the first service this morning, I got, man, I got into it in a big way, and I almost thought about entitling my message, The Blood Red Brook. I want to talk to you about that. Let's read Exodus 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters. God help us. Men was wearing earrings back in those days. And of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned, and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. Which, and, and, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Can I just stop before I read verse 6? Isn't it a sight that they're trying to drag God into all this? I mean, here they have, they've made them this false god, and they built an altar because they got to give it some kind of a semblance of, uh, of being the right thing. And then Aaron ups and says, all right, tomorrow we're going to have a big old feast day to the Lord. And they're worshiping a golden calf, and they're going to try to honor God with all that. You know, it sounds like to me, that's a whole lot of what's going on in a lot of churches this morning. They want to bring in their golden calves. They want to bring in their worldly music and their worldly atmosphere. And then they say, okay, we're here this morning to worship the Lord. Don't you think that makes God sick just a little bit? Now look at verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, having a party, and rose up to play. Now, as a background or a setting to this text this morning, we know that God has miraculously brought the nation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and slavery after 400 years. In fact, let me tell you this, God literally ruined and wrecked the economy of the most, in, the most powerful, influential nation on the earth of that time, a nation by the name of Egypt. God brought that nation down to its very knees just to get his people out. As of our text this morning, the people of God are barely three months out of the land of Egypt. They're three months removed from that divine deliverance from God getting them out of the land of Egypt. They have now, in their wilderness wanderings, they have come to a place, a mountain, by the name of Sinai. Moses has now gone up into that mountain. He went up there, and he's been with God up in that mountain for 40 days. 40 days in God's presence on top of Mount Sinai. Now, the number 40 in the Bible is the number of testing. And while Moses is away on top of the mountain, there's a great test going on down at the foot of the mountain with the nation of Israel. By the way, I might say a test that they're going to miserably fail. In fact, in just a little bit in this chapter, Moses also is going to be tested by God, a test in which he will gloriously pass. But this chapter that is before us, the sin of Sinai, what I'm preaching about this morning easily divides itself into three sections. So what I'd like to do this morning is I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the sin of Sinai. I want to talk about the solution to Sinai. And I want to talk about the slaughter of of Sinai. All in this text this morning, you say, Preacher, what does an event that happened 4,000 years ago have to do with us living in these days, 2021, on June the 20th? Well, I want to tell you, it has a whole lot to do with us. And if you'll listen closely for just a moment, I'll try to work through this real fast. First of all, number one, let's talk a little bit about the sin 
of Sinai. Literally, what has taken place in this text before us? As I said just a moment ago, Moses has gone up into the mount to meet with God. And for 40 days, he's delayed. He's been up there on that mountain. He didn't come back immediately. His coming back was delayed just a little bit. In fact, before he went up into the mountain, here's what he said to the nation of Israel. In Exodus 24, 14, Moses said, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. Moses said, I'm going away, but now don't worry about it. I'm going to come back, and y'all just wait here for me. I'll be back in just a little while. And yet, when he didn't come back immediately, the nation of Israel began to wander away from God. They began to do things that was totally against the will of God for their life. They quickly, very quickly, turned aside and fell into corruption. I got to thinking about how that's like, how that is like the day and age in which you and I are living in. You see, our Savior left heaven and came into this world and he left it all. Didn't even bring a piece of a jasper wall they sang about just a moment ago. He left all of that and came into this world. He lived in this world for 33 years. Then for six hours he died on an old rugged cross. Three days he laid in a tomb and 40 days after his resurrection he caught a cloud and he went back into heaven. But he said to his followers before he went away in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11 this same Jesus which has taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go away. Now he hasn't come back like Moses. He hasn't come back immediately. And somehow because of that delay God's people have begun to wonder, is he ever going to come back? And because they begin to wonder if he's going to come back, they begin to wonder away from God. But I got good news for you folks. Jesus is still coming. His coming is still right on time. He's coming back. Hey, let's Let's don't fall into depravity. Let's don't fall into debauchery. Let's don't corrupt ourselves quickly and turn aside from the Lord. Let's wait for Jesus and do what's right till he comes back again. Well, that's what happened in our text. The Bible said Moses delayed his coming. And the word of God said when he delayed his coming, the nation of Israel fell into sin. Now, as best I can tell from this chapter, there are two great sins that the nation of Israel committed in this chapter. Obviously, in verse number 2 and verse number 3, the first sin that they committed, I would call that the sin of idolatry. The sin of idolatry. And by the way, I mean, this is absolutely unbelievable. These people are barely three months out of the land of Egypt. They have saw everything that God has done for them down there. All the power and the miracles that God manifested down in the land of Egypt. They saw the one and the only and the true God destroy all the other gods in the land of Egypt. In fact, every plague that God, brought, that God brought upon the land of Egypt, what he was doing was destroying one of the false gods that the Egyptians worshipped. They were polytheistic. They had many gods that they worshipped. They had a god. They had a frog god. Boy, we know what God did with the frogs. They had a fly god. I mean, they had they worshipped the river Nile. God turned it to blood. They worshipped fish and God killed all the fish in the waters in the land of Egypt. One plague after another, God was destroying all the false gods in the land of Egypt. God was saying to the land of Egypt, much as he says to America, there's only one God. There's not many gods. Hey, there's not a God for this and a God for that. There's not here a God, there a God, everywhere a God, a God. No, sir, there's only one God, and that God is identified by the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible said in Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for for I am God, and beside me there is none else. You didn't come to a Baptist church to listen to a Baptist preacher talk about the many gods of our culture. No, sir, I want to point you to the one, the true and the only God that there is this morning. And he has a boy by the name of Jesus, and he loves you, and he wants you to be a part of his family this morning. Well, one of those false gods in the land of Egypt was a god by the name of Apis, A P. I-S. It was a bull god. You know, down in the land of Egypt, man, they revered bulls 
in the land of Egypt. In fact, I read this. Any time in the land of Egypt when a bull died, they mummified it. And then they, uh, they embalmed it, they mummified it, uh, mummified it, and then they placed it in its own sarcophagus. And right outside of that sarcophagus, like we would do on a tombstone, they put the name of the bull, the date of its birth, and also the day of its death. Well, we know that one of the plagues that God brought upon the nation of Egypt was a plague called a grievous moraine. The word moraine means a disease, especially a disease that affects livestock. And God brought a disease upon all the cattle in the land of Egypt. In fact, we read about it in Exodus 9 verse 6. The Lord did that thing on the morrow and all the cattle of Egypt died. You know what God was doing? He was showing that crowd in the land of Egypt that he was God even over the false God by the name of Apis. God showed his mighty power over Apis. And yet we read in our text that the nation of Israel has taken their gold. They've thrown it in a pot. They've melted it down. Aaron's got a fashioning to, and he fashioned unto them a false god, a golden calf, just like they'd saw down in the land of Egypt, and they're falling down and worshiping of all things a golden calf. Isn't that a sight? I mean, just having seen all that God did for them in the land of Egypt, now they want to fall down on their faces and worship a golden calf. In fact, if you look at chapter 32 and in verse number, uh, verse number 4, they want to attribute all that happened to them in the land of Egypt, all that God did for them in the land of Egypt, they want to attribute that now to this golden calf. It wasn't the God of heaven that brought them out. Now they're saying of all things, how ludicrous this golden calf did all that for us in the land of of Egypt. Boy, idolatry. Oh, my soul. You talk, by the way, God was ticked off about this. I mean, God is careful with his glory. If you want God to bless your life, give him the glory. Amen. If you want God to bless him a church, don't give the glory to a preacher. Don't give the glory to a deacon or a song or a, or a, or a, or a choir member or, or a soloist. Give the glory to God. By the way, he's worthy of the glory. Point it to him. And boy, I'll tell you something that ticks God off bad is when somebody else is given the glory that is due unto his name. As I look in this text, I see there's a sin of idolatry. But I don't only see in this text there's the sin of idolatry. I see there's the sin of immorality. You see, what they worshipped, how they worshipped, and what they believed in affected how they lived their lives. Can I just stop and say this? A corrupt message will always produce corrupt morals. Can I tell you this, that how you believe or what you believe will affect how you behave? Your creed will always show up in your conduct. You may tell you why America's living wrong. They're believing wrong. Anytime you want to pull God down to the level of man or you want to pull the holy and the righteous God of heaven down like, and make him like unto four-footed beast and make him like an image to fall down and worship, can I stop and just say this? Your living is going to go south when you start worshiping and believing the wrong thing about God. In Romans chapter 1 and verse number 24, the Bible said they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God like unto an image made like unto corruptible men and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And then the Bible said God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own bo their hearts, to dishonor their own bodies uh, to between themselves. And that chapter, same chapter, goes on and starts talking about homosexuality and men turning to men and women turning to women. You know why people are doing that? They believe wrong. They don't believe nothing to start with, and they believe wrong. And it shows up in their brand, in their, in their way of of living. In verse number 25 of this text, if you want to see what was going on, in verse number 6, the Bible said they were eating and drinking and rose up to play. Now, I want to tell you something. I'm not trying to cause you to force, uh, think, uh, to, 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 to think some unclean thoughts, but that phrase, rose up to play, has a sexual tone to it. They ate, they drank, they drank their alcohol, and then they rose up to play immorality. If you don't believe that, look over in verse 25 of this same chapter. And by, the Bible said that Aaron had made them naked. 
So I'm talking about here are millions of people dancing around a golden calf, drunk as high as a Georgia pine, and they're drunk, and they're, and, and they're full, and they're naked, and they're... You talk about debauchery and depravity going on. These people have sinned and sinned grievously and greatly against God. In fact, let me tell you what I did. I went through this chapter, and best I can tell, best I can tell, they broke in this one chapter seven out of the Ten Commandments. Some people say they broke eight of them. I counted seven different commandments they broke in this one chapter. In fact, this sin that they committed in chapter 32 is so great and so grievous against God that it's mentioned 25 other times in the Bible. Here's where it's mentioned on one occasion in Psalms 106 verse 19. The Bible said they made a calf in Horeb and worshiped the molten image. The Bible said they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. The Bible said they forgot God. God their Savior, which had done great things for them in the land of Egypt. And let me just tell you this, God was highly offended. God was highly angered because of what the people had done in making this golden calf to worship. Now I want you to look this way. I know we're living in a day and an age and a culture that wants to come to church and hear all about the love of God. And by the way, aren't you glad God loves us? I'm glad that I can stand up here this morning and proclaim a God of love, a God who loves you so much he gave his son to die in your place and my place on the cross of Calvary. But sometimes in our attempts to, uh, to uh, magnify the love of God, we minimize the wrath of God and the holy hatred of God as it burns towards sin. Hey, I just want to stop and tell you this. He's a God of love. He's a God that will forgive you, but you hear me and hear me well. He's highly offended by the way you're living. He's highly offended by you ignoring him and forgetting him and attributing to what you got to your own ingenuity and your own industriousness. No, sir, we don't make anything of ourselves. If for anything, God did it. Give him the glory. Amen. God was angered. You say, preacher, I don't believe that. Look at verse 10, Exodus 32. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them that I may consume them. You know what that tells me? God was offended, highly offended by their sin. I just want to say one more time that God is highly offended though he loves us but he's offended, he's angered, he's irritated, whatever other synonym you want to use. But God is angered and offended by our sin. That's right. I mean, God gets angry when we sin. When we go out of this building right here and we turn our back and forget about God and smoke our weed and pop our drugs and live in our immorality and drink our alcohol and live as if God doesn't exist. I just want to tell you, there's one word for that. God is angered by all of that. He's highly offended by you using the life that he gives you. He's highly offended by you using the air that he lets you breathe and the water he lets you drink and the sun he lets you bask in and the planet that you live on. God is highly offended and angered by the fact that you use that to please yourself and to live for the devil. God is angered by that. It's about time we come back to church again and don't hear about some mammy-pammy, lacy-drawered God who sits up there and says, boys will be boys and girls will be girls. I don't declare unto you some sissy God. I declare unto you a holy and a righteous God who burns with anger toward our sin. Amen and amen. God is highly offended. And by the way, Moses was highly offended. If you look there in this same chapter, chapter 32, the Bible said there in verse number 15, verse 16, verse 17 and 18, when Moses come down off that mount, man, he saw what was going on. God saw it. Moses couldn't see it when he got down there, saw that dancing, that nudity, that drunkenness, that, that party lifestyle going on. He took those tables that God had just wrote the Ten Commandments on and threw them down and broke them. He was highly angered about what he saw. Let me tell you why he was angry about it. He'd been up in the presence of God 
for 40 days. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't get into the presence of God and not have a holy hatred toward that which brings God dis, uh, dishonor and, 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 and brings reproach on God. I'll tell you, I know we're sitting in a church today and our churches are full of people that say, why is a preacher against this? Why is a preacher against that? I don't see anything wrong with just a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a little bit of drinking, a little bit of drug, a little bit of rock music. I don't see anything wrong with that. Why does he get so angry? Could it be the man of God has been in the presence of God and when you and I get into the presence of God ladies and gentlemen we'll have a holy hatred against sin you can get mad at me for preaching against things if you want to but I tell you it's about high time somebody gets up yonder in the presence of God and comes off the mountain not looking for a place of approval but bless God just hunting a place he can stand with an armful of the word of God and deliver the message of God Dead men. Hey, this ain't no manby pamby, sissy lacy drawered, a kind of a church man. Give it to us straight. Thank God for a man of God who will get up yonder somewhere and come down here and say, okay, I don't care if you like it. Bless God, you bunch of chihuahuas in here that's trying to bite at my heels and nip at me. You bite away. You ain't nothing but a chihuahua anyway. I want to draw into God's presence and get a message from God and come down here and say, okay, this is what God has to say about it. Amen. I already got mad in this service too. Yes, sir. I'm telling you this sin offended God. This sin hurt the heart of God. This sin broke the heart of God and it broke the heart of the man of God. Thank God for some men that will still stand. Hey, I don't care if you like it. I'm not hunting your approval. I don't want to be a little Aaron running around trying to please everybody. Thank God I want to try to be a Moses who's drawn up the presence of God. Come into this place with an arm full of his word and stand up and say, this is what God says about it. The sin, the sin. But not only do we see the sin in this chapter, number two, we see the solution in this chapter. So Moses is back down. The word of God, the law of God that they've broken is in crumbled on the ground. And God didn't even get mad at him for breaking it. Another chapter two over, he's going to just write them again. God didn't even get mad at the man of God for throwing down the word of God. No, sir. Moses is back down there, sees what's happened. Now draw your attention to verse 20. Don't miss this. The Bible said that he took the calf which they had made. What was the calf made out of? Made out of gold. He took that calf which they had made and he burned it in the fire and he ground it to powder and he strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink of it? What's he doing? Well, I got to tell you, for years, for years I had preached this along these lines. I've said that Moses come down and destroyed that, that golden bull, that golden calf they made. He broke it all to pieces, put it in the water, and he made the children of Israel to drink out of it as an illustration of the bitterness of sin. And by the way, I think you can make application to that. I really do. You know, sin that starts off so sweet always winds up so bitter. Can I have an amen? amen. Sin that promises ecstasy always winds up in the agony. agony. Sin that promises thrills always winds up in kills. It always starts off sweet to the taste, but it always winds up in the bitterness of bondage and addiction. And I preached for years. He ground it up, throwed it in the water, made them drink it, and oh, it did taste bad going down. And he's trying to remind them of the bitterness that God experiences when his people turn aside into sin. But let me tell you what I did this week. My daddy was a, a huge fan of M.R. Dion. I don't know if you've ever heard of M.R. Dion. He was a medical doctor. He got saved. And God called him to preach. And he was an evangelist, a great man of God. My daddy went out and bought every book that M.R. Dion ever had. One of those books, and he gave them all to me, one of those books is called The Chemistry of the Blood. And in chapter 3 of that book, he addresses this situation in Exodus 32. And here's what he said about it. 
He said that Moses took that golden calf and he broke it apart. And then he, he, he melted it. And then he stamped it. He beat on it. And then he, he ground it like into dust. He just ground it as fine as he possibly could. In fact, over in the book of Deuteronomy, same story, we read this about it. I took your sin, Moses said, the calf which you had made, and burned it with fire, stamped it, ground it very small, even until it was the smallest dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. And then he called all Israel, hey, everybody, hey, come over here. Drink that water. It's in that brook. Now, again, an application of the bitterness of sin. But here's what M.R. Dion said. He said gold in water is indissolvable. You can't, you can't dissolve gold into water. If you take a, a gold bar and you melt it down and you get a little, little uh, applicator and pull you one drop of gold out of, that, wa- uh, out of that, that melted gold and drop it in water, it'll keep its form all the way down. And when it hits the bottom, it'll spread out, but it'll stay together because it's indissolvable in water. But he said if you grind gold up into very fine powder and you drop it into water and you stir it up, that water will become a blood red color. In fact, he said that when Moses was in the schools of Egypt... He studied chemistry. He had the finest education that Egypt could offer. Moses knew what would happen if you ground it to dust, put it into that creek water, stirred it all up. It would turn that whole, whole creek into a blood red color. And then he commanded, y'all come over here. <laughs> You're a great sinner. But the blood is the solution for your sin. Drink of the blood Red book. All Israel, come over here. You've sinned. Get, draw, drink from the book. To drink from that brook, they had to get down on their knees. And they got down on their knees. They humbled themselves. And they got down and they, they drunk of the blood red water of the book, of the brook. Now, you say, preacher, what's all that got to do with us? I'm glad you asked. Look at this verse. Jesus said, Whoso drinketh my blood hath eternal life. He went on to say this, He that drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now, you say, I don't know, we live in a day and age when people don't think along spiritual lines, so you're probably sitting there thinking, Preacher, are you telling us we got to drink the blood of Jesus to be saved? No, what Jesus is doing here is using a figure of speech. You know, we use figures of speech all the time. You ever heard somebody that read a book and they said, man, I devoured that book. Does that mean they ate that book? Or, man, they just were all about that book. How about you? You ever heard this statement before? Man, he swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. Did that mean he just swallowed a hook and a line and a sinker? Of course not. That just meant, man, he's gullible, isn't he? Well, when Jesus said, unless you drink my blood... You have no forgiveness. Unless you drink, if you drink my blood, I'm in you and you're in me. He's using a figure of speech and he's saying this, unless the blood has been applied, unless the blood has been appropriated, unless the blood has been received, you don't dwell in me and I don't dwell in you. Unless you receive the blood, there is no forgiveness. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you there's still only one cure for the disease of sin. There's still only one solution for the problem of sin. There's still only one one remedy that heaven recognizes, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. You can become a Baptist, and you'll die and go to hell a Baptist. You can get baptized in that baptistry, and you'll die and go to hell from the baptistry. You can turn over a new leaf as many times as you want to, and you'll die and go to hell with a new leaf. But I'm here to tell you, friend, if you receive the blood of Jesus... He dwells in you. You dwell in Him. There is a solution for the sin. But now come up close and we're done. Not only the sin and the solution, but I want you to see the slaughter. 
If you look over in the same chapter, chapter 32, and look, if you will, in verse number 28, Moses said, all right, now, who's on the Lord's side? And the Bible said, the tribe of Levi came unto him. He said, get your sword and go through the camp. And the Bible said they went through the camp. Now watch this with their sword. And they killed 3,000 men. They killed 3,000 men. What's the story behind all that? Why the slaughter after the solution? I mean, why did they... Here's a great day. There's been a great sin, but there's been a great, a great salvation. They've drank of the water, the blood red brook. They've drank of that. Their sins have been atoned for. Why are they going to kill 3,000? The implication is there were 3,000 people in the nation of Israel that wouldn't drink of the blood of the brook. There are 3,000 that had the notion, man, I don't, I, don't, I don't go for that blood religion stuff. There's 3,000 down there that say, I'm not humbling myself and get down and drink of that brook. Hey, what will, my, what will my family think about me if I get over and drink of that brook? Hey, what will, my, what will my girlfriend think about me if I drink of that brook? Hey, what, what, will, what will those people that go to church with me over to Tabernacle think about me if I get down there and I'm not drinking that brook? Moses said, if you don't drink, you die. And they took their sword and they went through the camp and 3,000 people who refused to drink of the blood red brook perished that day because of their sin. Now we're done, but listen. I told you a moment ago, God is highly offended when you and I live, use the body and the life that he's given us to go out and serve ourselves. Serve. God's highly offended by that. But there's one thing that offends God more than that. And that is when you and I refuse to receive the blood, the solution that God has given to mankind, when we refuse to receive that, it's a smack in the face of a holy God. And God is greatly offended when you and I hear the message and turn away. God is angered when we will not receive the blood that His Son offered on Calvary. Brother Rick, come up here for just a second. I'm done, and I'll pay for your suit here in just a minute. You go get it clean and give me the bill for it. Listen up. At the end of time, there's a judgment called the great white throne judgment. At the end of time. The Bible said that Jesus, God, is going to sit upon a great white throne. And he doesn't have that meek and mild, lowly look on his face, that look of love and that look of, well, everybody's okay. But the Bible said the look on his face caused the earth and the heaven to flee away. You think about that. I mean, I remember when my daddy used to get mad. Nobody had to tell me when my daddy got mad. Nobody had to tell me when it was going to be on when I got home. I just saw the look on his face. You know what? He could even get mad at my sisters and I'd run and hide from that look on his face. Jesus has got this look on his face and it's so fearful, so solemn, so sobering that the earth and the heaven flee away from it. It's the judgment of the great white throne. It's where the sinners are going to be judged. And the Bible even seems to indicate on that day that some of those sinners are going to argue with the Savior when they're confined to hell forever, they're going to start jerking out tithing receipts and church baptismal uh, 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 certificates and, and, and membership forms from the Baptist church. And they're going to start saying, but Lord, you don't understand. You don't understand. I don't have to go to hell. I joined the church. I was baptized. I, 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 I performed many good works. I, I gave money. I did all of that. They're going to argue. And Jesus is going to turn them to him with that look upon his face, and he's going to say, but where's my blood? Where is the blood? It's all about the blood. Amen. I'll get this dry clean for you. You can be seated. <laughs> can I tell you something? Your church membership is going to do nothing but land you into hell. Your good members, that false profession you've made 25 times as a teenager, and yet you sit here in this service and you're lost as a ball in high weeds. Those 25 professions are not going to do you a dime's worth of good when you stand before God. Where is the blood? Amen. Only the blood. The only remedy that heaven recognizes 
is the blood of God's own son. And if you're going to go to heaven, something's got to be done about your sin. And the only thing God accepts is the blood from the blood red brook of Calvary. I'm so glad I took a drink. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I pray.